Call us back to order. Um, the clerk has told me that uh, the research indicates that uh, the previous motion did not uh, encompass the federal government. And so this amendment's in order. We've got that right, Councillor Carr, that's your view too? It's, uh, it's in order because it did not cover the federal government last time. Okay. So uh, having established that, uh, I, are we on an amendment queue, Madam Clerk? Okay. So does anybody want to speak to this amendment, which we've now established as an order? Councillor Reimer? It just simply reiterates a much slimmed down version of what we already passed, so whatever. Great. Thanks for that passionate comment. Um, Councillor Louis? Yes, I, I will speak to this. Um, Certainly, this is in the vein of everything that we've been ex espousing for some time now, and there's consistency in it. What I, I take issue with is that this is not part of a planned, concerted program to communicate with either province or the federal government. It's an add-on to a, a initiative to build, to look at the possibility of building uh, affordable home ownership within the city of Vancouver. And so we could add many other component pieces to this motion that are tangentially related to the issue of, of affordability in our city, but I would, I would appeal to Councillor Carr and members of council that if we are to communicate with the province, if we are to communicate with the federal government, that we do it in a coordinated fashion, that we do it as part of a campaign. I can tell you that in my conversations with either the province, the ministers of the province, and the ministers at the federal level, another amendment to a, another motion will have no effect. In fact, it detracts from our credibility when we communicate with them. So I, would, I will vote against, but my hope is that we, in fact, if we are communicating, and we are communicating, that we do as part of a campaign, not dissimilar to what we do at the FCM and talk about it as, and submit evidence-based and we do it as part of a larger framework rather than adding in a lot of component little pieces to a motion that is directed at something else entirely. Thank you, Councillor Tijanova. Thank you very much. I certainly will support the amendment. I think that one of the things that has been lacking is, uh, is consultation and collaboration with uh, <coughs> all levels of government, especially with the province, but also with the federal government, and I thank Councillor Carr for bringing this forward. I was very interested to learn, though, that amendments actually take away from motions and don't strengthen them, and I'll remind my colleagues of that when they put forward their own amendments to motions, because I don't think that we lose credibility over amendments. I think that, if anything, this just strengthens it. It asks them to, it asks them to make sure that they keep Vancouver front of mind in all out of all of the provinces and cities, if you look at housing prices and you look at, at, I'm sorry, if you look at housing prices and you also look at, at the medium income of a family, I think you'll see that Vancouver out of every city in Canada is, is the most out of line. So I do appreciate Councillor Carr keeping this front of mind for our federal and our provincial government and maybe it will also help in moving forward to ask for monies and investments and other things. Not so much just affordable home ownership but we have to keep housing front of mind and that's that's one of the reasons I chose to run for City Council is I just didn't see enough being done. Actually in fact in the past eight years, I haven't seen movement on this. I've seen uh, the ribbon cutting at the 14 uh, provincial sites that the province put together. But that being said, since then, there hasn't been a lot. And with all of this money that the federal government announced, I'm hoping that Vancouver will see that. But again, uh, there aren't any assurances about foreign ownership, housing prices, and how that affects the good work that we're trying to move forward. So for those reasons, I thank Councillor Carr for bringing this forward. I certainly will be supporting this, and I think that everyone should, especially those councillors that go out often to Ottawa and lobby the governments. I would, I would request that perhaps some councillors, you know, put their politics aside and not uh, perhaps beat up on the provincial government so much, and maybe we'd see a little more money. But that's my own opinion, so I will be supporting this. Thank you. I think that would be very much out, considered out of order in certain circumstances, but uh, let you finish it off. Councillor Jang. 
Thank you very much. I think I too will vote against this amendment. Uh, first of all, the federal portion may be in order, but the provincial government one is not. Uh, I think, like Councilor Louis said, as the, the city representative, uh, the UBCM, having several letters being thrown about this and that and the context of it, they, don't, are, they aren't heard. It is a concerted campaign, and I must say that concerted campaign about foreign ownership, about the influence of money, that has already been going on and is ongoing. I mean, the very fact that the province is now looking at it, the very fact that the federal government is looking at this, the fact that they're all moving in this direction means they've heard that message loud and clear, you know, for a very long time, and, and you know, they're working on it. Uh, when you, it, it takes a concerted campaign, and certainly I know that at UBCM, and when we look at even all the resolutions that come through, they're all, all over the place. You know, and I read, when we all read later on, the province's response, you know, they just treat it as a one-off because there's so many of them and they're all kind of related and all that kind of stuff. They don't see it all that seriously. But uh, certainly the campaign uh, that had been going, has been going certainly by FCM on these types of housing issues has, has really sparked the federal and provincial governments to move. I think it's just redundant and uh, so I won't be voting for it. Mr. Louis, some concluding remark. Uh, just to take a few seconds, Mr. Chair, to point out that, in fact, uh, my comments weren't that it detracts from the main motion, but it detracts from our ability to have credibility with those orders of government that we need support from. That the motion that, that I moved, uh, I, of course, I moved it and fully supported it, and I don't believe that it detracts from it, but it is, a, I think, a, not part of a, I think, a comprehensive and well thought out campaign. Having conversations is, is one thing, and I would I'd agree that uh, we need to have those conversations. That's like that, exactly what I do when I meet with Minister Duclos or Minister Murnau or Minister Sohi on infrastructure. These are conversations that, of course, I take the opportunity every time I speak with them. But I just want to remind Council that you know, before this current federal government, and this is, I speak specifically on that because that's where I spend most of my time advocating on our behalf as Vancouver Council, as Metro Vancouver and as across Canada as president of the SCM. I spend the time with them talking about the scope of the need across Canada. And it's not one motion that, that creates the, the impetus for that, for that minister to take action, but the logic of a, of a framework that we were able to present to them. I'm hoping that this program, if this pilot does in fact pass, that we may be able to leverage funding at some point in time. But let's give them something tangible to sink their teeth into. Let's give them a program that works and look and give them an example of how it works in this local context. You know, so I, I would say at that point in time, Maybe we, we funnel or direct them towards this program, but I think it's, it's uh, uh, detrimental to us in the, in the near term. And really, had it not been for, I, I think, our strenuous objections to the last federal government not investing into housing and having that healthy tension with our last federal government, we would not have had the response from the other parties, the Green Party, the NDP, and the Liberal Party all responded significantly to the call for investment into housing across the nation. And thankfully, one of those parties won. It happened to be the Federal Liberals. But had we not pushed hard and had that push against uh, the non-investment into housing with the Conservative government of the day, we would not be where we are today. Councillor Reimer. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, my interest in supporting it was really about trying to curtail the grandstanding and move on to the substance of the motion, but I have utterly failed in that. I do think that, um, as mentioned earlier today, when I supported a addition and then had to apologize for staff for suggesting um, that somehow we were um, besmirching their, their reputation that they wouldn't otherwise do the consultation they said they'd done. I think that similarly here, it degrades governance to do something that's politically expedient, i.e. try and stop some grandstanding, um, when really, it, it really is about thoughtful, reason, policy development and approach. And I supported the motion that was put properly on notice, uh, much more detailed in terms of what it was asking the province for, it was much clearer um, and had the public had a lot more opportunity to access that motion. Um, 
and i would say hearing our representative who spends the most time with the federal government outlined so clearly what has been done and the thoughtful reasoned approach being taken i don't feel that anything would be served by me participating in this grandstanding opportunity today so i will be voting against it and appreciate the points people have made uh, councillor carr Um, I'm very disappointed to hear those words from Councillor Reimer. Um, if she was intimating that I'm grandstanding, um, I, I certainly would, well, stating, <laughs> stating, um, then, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to bother calling a point of order, but, uh, but I feel that that is incredibly inappropriate. She ought to know me better, and I think the members at Council better, that I act with thoughtfulness around a problem. I think through the problems. I, um, I put this piece in this motion because, um, as I've stated throughout the debate we've had in the questioning of speakers, um, that I find it impossible to think that we can deal with affordable home ownership without dealing with the elephant in the room, which is the incredibly escalating prices in Vancouver, um, the out-of-control housing market, which is being driven um, by, uh, by foreign money. And uh, we don't, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take out the word provincial, if that gives comfort to people like Councillor Jang that this is not at all in any way redundant because we have not had a motion that directs the activity such as Councillor Louis says that he is pursuing um, from this council table at the federal government around the principle of controlling the market. Um, and uh, the reason I'm putting it into this motion again is because um, it fits within the context of wanting to do something about affordable home ownership, which is what this whole exercise and debate has been about. What are we going to do about affordable home ownership? And if we don't get at a root cause of unaffordability, how can we possibly come up with any kind of program that's going to be effective? Um, so I, um, I, you know, I'm not hearing or seeing an indication that it would make one would have difference whether I remove the word provincial. Um, I'm happy to do so if it, it would garner support from other councillors, um, but certainly ask that you consider that we do not have yet a motion from this council around um, the federal, um, our, our, our plea to the federal government, our impl imploration to the federal government that they act on this, and that it is entirely consistent with our aim to provide affordable home ownership. Well, I'll just say briefly that I disagree with it because I'm not persuaded that the sole reason we have problems in the housing market is because of foreign ownership. And, and, that's, uh, and th that's an important debate and one of important public concern that would be well debated in a separate motion. I noticed in the news this week that, that Australia has levied very heavy fines against offshore buyers who purchased real estate in Sydney. So they have a very restrictive regime there and they have some of the worst housing prices in the world in Sydney as well. So, you know, the, the line that, that usually gets drawn, I think uh, may be drawn wrongly. Uh, my view is that the private marketplace uh, will not deliver housing affordability in the conditions we have, whether or not there's foreign investment. So I hate to see it uh, just put there. I think the purpose and uh, justification for the programs we're undertaking is that these are areas where the private sector has demonstrably failed to produce housing that's desperately needed. And so we've had to step in and that's the discussion that I think is here today. So could we go to a voting queue, please? Please show. Okay, so it's uh, five uh, in opposition uh, to it, so the motion fails. Uh, opposed are Megs, Louis. Oops, what do we got here? I don't know, can we, uh, it was there for a minute. We got the results? <clears throat> or do we have to do it again? Sorry, I'm not sure what you're sending to me. I was just looking for the results of the screen and I don't see them. Oh, by email, okay. So, I don't have my email on either, hang on. Okay, we're just calling the vote, so.
Okay. So in opposition, we have uh, Louis, Jang, Reimer, Affleck, and Megs. So, so it uh, fails. Okay. So let's go on to the uh, main motion. Are we back on the main queue now? Ready to go? Okay, Councillor Dijanova. Happy, I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to see that there is a step, it may be a baby step, in the direction of affordable home ownership. Mm -hmm. And I am happy to see that this council has shown the courage to move forward with affordable home ownership. In fact, I spent the better part of my weekend going through the archives going through archived motions just to see how many motions have been put forward uh, by this government and this council, including affordable home ownership over the past eight years. And I couldn't find any that specifically asked for affordable home ownership. I was very excited last year when council voted unanimously uh, with the motion that I put forward that Councillor Ball uh, seconded and Councillor Affleck uh, was a large part of supporting as well. Uh, to move forward with this. And I know that, that I've had conversations with some councillors who simply didn't feel that affordable home ownership, you know, it might be difficult. There, it might cause headaches. We're not quite sure how we do that. We're one of the most affordable cities. But I look at it, and since 1986, we have, it, housing has, has uh, what is, what's the figure staff showed us? 280 percent is what the market increase has been and that's just out of reach i mean i do wonder what it was eight years ago when promises were made for housing affordability when this government came in to to city hall however you know if we can just move forward i've learned that you know with certain things here at council that's you know if that's what i can do if i can help by putting a motion forward and and make this an issue and uh councillor louis i'm i'm happy to see that you have just you see the value through the chair please oh i'm sorry through through the chair to councillor louis i'm so happy to hear today that you value this and that you want younger people millennials people my age and younger to be able to live in vancouver one day to be able to own a piece of property not to have to move out to maple ridge and for vancouver to remain uh a city that welcomes everyone. You know, here we are, we're welcoming in people uh, that, and I'm completely supportive of this, but we're welcoming Syrian refugees. We, we're a city that welcomes everyone, and we won't even find a way to allow uh, children or children's children. You know, many people, I just, just a few days ago, a woman came up to me and she had said, I understand that this motion is coming forward to council, and I have been fortunate enough fortunate enough to buy in the market, but she was pregnant and she said to me she could not imagine her child one day being able to purchase a home, not even a condo, in the market the way Vancouver is going. So I'm happy that, to hear that we're moving in the right direction. I'd like to take a moment, actually more than a moment if I can, to thank staff for all of their work on this. I know that our chief housing officer uh, and all of his staff uh, have worked tirelessly on this. And it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been one model and you said that that's okay and we're gonna move forward with that. You have, in a sense, used a hybrid of models and come up with a new approach that will work for Vancouver. And that will work for Vancouver not just this year but 50 years out and I think that that is so important it really is because we need to look at the future here when I've been asked and I've worked in the private sector but in nonprofit housing for a number of different nonprofits and people ask me uh, how how do you build affordable housing and I say you buy it now and it'll be affordable in 30 years and we have to start somewhere it might not be as affordable as we want it to be but it will be affordable if we start now if we don't start now, though, just as I'm, I'm afraid to ask what the number was eight years ago, it's 280% now, but I'm sure it was somewhere, you know, it was a little bit lower than that eight years ago. So if we can all come together and we can move forward on this, I think that we will see a change, not just for this generation, but for other generations, the next generation, for young families who, I mean, it's really disheartening for me to see that young families 
you know, children are sharing bedrooms with their parents simply because their parents maybe want to stay closer to them. They don't want to do that hour or two hour commute that other people do so that they can achieve a better home. They want to live in the best city in the world and we should support them in doing that. So I'm really excited uh, to move forward with this program. I'd like to thank our staff. I know it's going to be a long road uh, to achieve the pilot program. We're going to have to uh, lobby the province and I will be out there lobbying the province for this charter change and I hope every other city councillor will put their political differences aside if they have any and they will lobby for this with me because this isn't just for for us it doesn't matter what government is in power this is for generations to come and the people who will be living in Vancouver one day so I hope that uh, that we'll be able to move forward it's going to require us all rolling up our sleeves. It's going to require some really hard work. But right now, there's 77% of people in the city of Vancouver who currently don't own who would like to. And I would like to see the number go down from 70% who think they never will. So thank you very much. Councillor Carr. Oh, sorry. Okay, there we go. Thank you. First of all, I would just like to thank everybody who, um, who came to speak to us and all those people who um, emailed us, uh, wrote to us uh, their concerns, uh, their ideas, um, and staff for the preparation of, of the report and the consideration um, of, uh, of the many challenges uh, in pulling this kind of a program together. Um, we need affordable home ownership. I mean, without it, we are losing people in this city, young people, uh, people who want to be able to stay, who want to work here, but end up leaving, taking jobs elsewhere, moving outside the city because they simply can't afford uh, to buy a home. Um, and uh, and so for from just a livability, a, a sense of community, um, our economy, we we do need it. Um, and we need um, we need programs to move forward that give of young people in particular hope. Um, and uh, and so um, just for the very initiative of home ownership, I, I do thank Councillor Di Genova for bringing this up to Council and the fact that, uh, that we are having this discussion. I don't believe in giving people false hope, however. Um, and in terms of, of false hope, I think it's, uh, it's very important to look at whether or not uh, what we're moving forward with is feasible. Um, that in fact, you know, will it deliver on the promise of greater affordability in terms of home ownership? We talked to, uh, there were many, many people who, who came to spoke and who inputted through emails. And they had a lot of concerns, which I'm talking about resident and neighborhood associations who said they didn't feel consulted. And some people say, well, there's room for consultation. But you know, from my perspective, um, the whole value of consultation is not to tick off a box saying we've consulted. It is to generate ideas. It is to get from people a sense of ideas that we might not otherwise have if we limit that consultation. Um, and uh, certainly, the very ideas around retaining um, the current kinds of housing that we've got uh, that are way more affordable because they were built long ago and they've been held on to. Um, that, that, um, that and the uh, incredible importance um, people who came to speak to us placed on the character home review and the process of, of looking at that and renovating buildings and providing for some greater opportunities for ownership um, through um, retaining those older buildings, I think is something that uh, we needed to embed more in this and we need to be thinking more clearly about as uh, one alternative to uh, affordable home ownership that's not in this particular package. Um, certainly I've, I've uh, uh, done a lot of research on the, on the Whistler model and, um, and there, there are many advantages to that model that aren't also included in this. For example, um, asking developers to provide at cost, not pegging the program on some value value in relation to market price, 20% or more below market price, but at the cost to a developer of producing um, the, the housing so that then that housing can be at a more affordable level. When I talk to people in Whistler, they say it's around 50% less than the cost um, that, uh, that goes to market. Uh, that's, a huge, that's a huge difference and a positive one. I have um, a lot of concern around the, um, the feasibility because of that 20% below market being the kind of benchmark of affordability. I don't believe that with market prices going the way they are that we can achieve uh, affordability without uh, 
immeasurable amount of public input of money that we don't have right now. Um, therefore, uh, I, I think that, uh, that we need to look. That's why I think I, I put forward my amendment to look at what is driving those escalating prices. And I'm, I'm deeply disappointed uh, that, uh, that this council has chosen to reject that amendment. Um, I, I find it, the debate was very revealing to think that there are councillors at this table, um, Councillor Meggs, for example, who said that he doesn't think um, that it's as big a factor, that, the, um, that foreign money coming into the city is not as big a factor as, to me, it's, it's, well, it's very revealing and shows how difficult it is to actually move forward with any kind of lobbying efforts if there's no um, sense of direction from council as a whole. So, um, for those reasons, um, I won't be voting um, in support of this program. Although, let me reiterate, I do believe a program to achieve affordable home ownership is extremely important. Thank you, Councillor uh, Jang. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Certainly a lot of finger pointing and insinuations going on here today. Uh, take, I'm going to take the historical perspective. And certainly I want to thank our staff for working on this. A project. It goes back to, I remember, 2011, our housing and homeless plan, where we had the continuum go up from all the way from shelters, which were controversial, interim housing, all the way straight through to affordable home ownership. And now we've popping along this continuum there, plugging in the gaps. You know, we had a Rental 100 program that's been a, a very successful, where 1,000 units provided uh, per year. Our shelter program has become the model for other communities to take. Our interim housing programs, there's been a lot accomplished on our housing programs and the housing homeless plan. And uh, this is the next piece of it is the ho affordable home ownership piece. You know, we have to do everything we can and as quickly as we can to help people buy a house. To, you know, that is the dream of so many and we have to do it as quickly as we can and we have to do it as, as and, and, and try all the different ways we can do it. And I think this is a very interesting way. It's very clever and unique and I'm uh, very glad to see it come forward. But this goes back a long way. And it did take a long time to get here because I remember in 2011, I was kind of like, how are, we, how are you going to do this? Like, I had no idea what models existed in the world. And, uh, you know, all the time our staff had doggedly worked away at it and uh, they've come up with something very good. So I'm very happy to support this. And once again, it's really about, really about making sure folks can get into the market if they want to do that. It, it's making sure people, if they want to rent, have long-term rentals to do that. And to make sure those who have, you know, living on the streets get somewhere to go in to get help. It's all about the continuum. It's just not about one thing or another. And I think that's where this debate has gotten off track. It's always about one section, but not looking at the entire housing continuum. So I'm very happy to support this. Thank you very much. Councillor uh, Affleck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, well, first of all, I'll thank uh, Councillor De Genova, who took this from uh, the side of a desk into the center of the desk for us to, to deal with and move forward with uh, quicker. <clears throat> this is a challenging issue, uh, I think. You know, I, I think I, certainly as a parent uh, who has three kids who would love them to stay in Vancouver for the rest of their lives, uh, one of the ways to do that is to get them to buy a piece of property in Vancouver, uh, in my mind, um, uh, to, to give them you know, ownership and, and to feel that there's uh, something really tying them down. So. That's certainly my philosophy on how you um, can keep your family uh, in your own town. And uh, um, <clears throat> the, the challenge we have in Vancouver is it's becoming increasingly uh, unaffordable, as we all know. So any possibility for us as a council to find solutions for affordability, uh, we need to pursue them. Um, uh, I, of course, am challenged in this report by the connection to the IRP. Uh, because I don't have a lot of faith in that program uh, and I find it somewhat intrusive and I've voted against it but uh, and I don't think it's doing its job uh, however the staff have assured me that they will um, uh, keep an open mind as we work through this process that there might be better ways to do this there might be things that they learn along the way that could could either improve that program uh, or create another program specific to this issue uh, altogether so um, we need to change the mechanism to, to be able to do this through the charter, so uh, that's the first step. And uh, to do that, we have to provide the authority for staff to go and do that. So uh, the main focus of today, in my mind, was to uh, give the authority to staff to begin that process and then begin the public consultation process. And that's what I heard today, and I assure the, I, I think 
this, the people that came here today and, and who I hope are listening and will hear about this afterwards, I hope are assured that this is the beginning of a process uh, and we are on a journey and we'll see what happens. But um, uh, so for those reasons, I will support this today. Thanks. Mr. Deal. Thanks very much. Um, I just had a few comments of my own. Uh, this is part of that affordability spectrum that we've been talking about for a very long time, and as we all know. And if we leave this piece, place, uh, it's late, this piece out, then as Councillor Louie has referred to before, we have this problem where people who could own under a program like this don't. They're in rental suites uh, that could be rented by people who can't afford to get into affordable home ownership. And the cascading uh, result is that people are, are, are um, displacing people at the least affordable or at the most affordable end of the spectrum, which is getting into the social housing. You have people who are staying in housing intended for low incomes who might have been able to, through sharing with a friend or, or co-housing, gotten into a different, a different type of housing and they're displacing people. So I think that you have to have all those options on the table in order to ensure that people find the right place for them. I'm very lucky. I got into a one-bedroom apartment in the 70s building in Kitsilano 20 plus years ago as temporary as a temporary place while I figured out how to figure out uh, how to be single again after my divorce. I'm still there and I love it, but I would not be able to get there today. And um, and and for all the teachers and for all the emergency service workers and for all the biologists and for all the people who work in not-for-profits. We, we need all kinds of people living in the city, and this is a very important piece of that puzzle. So for those reasons, I will be supporting this. We do need to do more cons consultation. I'm looking forward to that piece of the process, but the first thing we need is that charter change so that we can even look at how to best allow people to live in our city across that entire affordability spectrum that's so important to us. Mr. Reimer? Well, I'm going to speak in support of the recommendations. I was um, just going back through the council minute archives because I, I had a very different um, recollection of, of the timeline. I um, mean, was reading through the minutes of the December 13th, 2011 meeting where affordable home ownership was first introduced by council and Councillor Jang, actually, um, and Mayor Robertson brought it forward. Um, and how, <laughs> how much it highlighted for me how difficult this is that five years later, our biggest argument seems to be over who gets credit for it, not what we actually um, need to do to get it happening. It is a massive piece of work to move forward and notwithstanding all of the issues that have been brought forward, um, around foreign money, foreign ownership. Uh, somebody talked about the escalation of land values, which of course is a problem. Nobody yet has mentioned the stagnation of incomes, which is equally a problem. In fact, if one looks at a graph, perhaps even more so than the skyrocketing land values. Uh, so there's a myriad of issues. I would say that it was heartening to see that back in December 2011, um, Councillors Affleck, Carr, Ball, Deal, Stevenson, Louis, Meggs, myself, all voted unanimously to support the concept of moving forward on a pilot. And today the only difference I see is that we're being asked to support specific goals around it that need, in my opinion, are not controversial. Um, a charter change, again, um, the fact that we need provincial government um, space to be able to move on that um, is as a result of five years of exploration about what the possible models could be. Um, a very significant consultation program. These all seem like logical next steps. I, I'm not sure what's changed about the act the, the tone of the debate in that five year interval, um, but I would suggest that if it took us five years to get here with um, some cohesion of purpose, it's going to take a lot longer if we can't figure out a way to find more cohesion moving forward. So I, I hope we can support these goals and move forward. Um, as, a, as a group that puts its vote where its mouth is when it comes to affordability. Thank you. Um, are you looking to wind up, Councillor Lee? Okay, and we haven't heard from you yet, Councillor Stevenson. Did you want to debate this? Okay, then I'll. Uh, make a few comments before uh, I turn over to Councillor Lee to end up. Um, I have never uh, made any bones about my concern that the role of foreign ownership was poorly understood. That's why I've always asked for more data. And, uh, as, and I, I don't say that it has no impact, but I note that the findings so far show it to be much lower to the disappointment of those who raise it all the time than was previously anticipated. And 
One of the studies unfortunately relied on the apparent ethnicity of people's surnames as opposed to proper research. So I think there's, um, there's work to be done on that front. And I would love to see dramatic changes in our federal and national policies to say, for example, have uh, controls on foreign ownership of our oil industry. But we haven't gone that far yet. And so I think it'll be a while before we get to land. I've uh, spent time with Dr. Lee. I've read his book. I've been to his lectures. And, uh, and I, I know that he's an eminent and careful scientist. But I also know that he thought that when they canceled the uh, high net worth investor program, we'd see a decline in housing price escalation. And we didn't. And so I would just like to uh, uh, stay on the evidence and uh, not uh, create false hope that somehow or other uh, some dramatic change on that front would lead to a moderation of housing prices because there's a lot of people who are very much committed to housing prices continuing to remain at least at their current level. Um, so that's on the foreign investment front. I'd like to talk briefly about consultation because uh, I was involved, as uh, Councillor Lewis uh, pointed to, to the Mayor's Task Force. It was created by an election mandate to fight against homelessness, to fight for affordable housing. Uh, it met with eminent people. It, it has, I, don't, I think, I've lost count of the number of reports that have come to Council as a result of its recommendations, including the comprehensive report itself. And from that day forward, uh, affordable home ownership was on the list after we had tried to house the homeless, after we had tried to work on the problems of the, uh, of, uh, uh, the people who are tenants in the, in the city who are about 50% of our population. And we've made big headway on those fronts. And yes, uh, the 14 sites were completed. But uh, thousands of rental units, which we uh, alone among uh, uh, municipalities, the Lower Mainland, have been able to create. So, I don't think nothing's happened. It wasn't nothing. It's not like nothing was going on until uh, until a motion last summer. In fact, an enormous amount of work has been done. Uh, I think that uh, we just have to be realistic. And I liked Councillor Carr's comment that uh, it would take enormous amounts of public funds to achieve the affordability of 50%. And so to say that there is some magic bullet out there that can do it otherwise, I think does create false hopes. This is a very difficult program to implement. It requires legal changes. It requires careful analysis and a whole bunch of other things. And it's been something that has been, as the report says, in the policy manual to develop for at least since 2012. And, uh, and so now here we are at this point, and I think that it's good that we're going to explore it further, but there's plenty of work to do. So I'm happy to support it, and, uh, and I look forward to further discussions, perhaps in a separate and isolated form about uh, foreign investment in our real estate sector, which has frankly been provincial public policy uh, since the 1980s to encourage uh, foreign investment in our real estate sector. So we will be swimming upstream, and perhaps we will have to roll up our sleeves and have arguments with people we would, some councillors would prefer not to argue with, but uh, I'm up for that personally. So, uh, Councillor Lou, if you want to say the last few words, then we'll... Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me start by saying that this is an important issue, and it's part of a much larger important issue, which is housing affordability, homelessness, rental housing in our city, being able to buy and live in our city. And uh, there's a great number of people that cannot currently do that in any part of that housing continuum. The importance of this component is very much that, but it's not the only important piece. And I don't want this debate today to, for us to forget how important that entire housing continuum is. I recall clearly the, all that conversation that was a, that, uh, Councillor Meggs has, has uh, spoken about the task force and the work that had gone into that. And today, uh, for the sake of, I think, a bit of credit, um, there's discussion on what started this. Let's not forget that there was a tremendous amount of effort by those people that sat on that task force and many before that. that there's a tremendous effort on staff that are doing work to try to advance what we have passed and had previously passed in council and that's what gets these things moving, not motions, not words, it's action. And so today, what we have is the ability to take action, something that's within our direct control, to vote for a program, to advance a program that will help citizens, residents of our city. The question is whether or not you'll vote for it. Now, we've had some conversations about lobbying and how important it is to speak out and send the message to the province and send the message to the federal government. I can tell you that a vote of council, a unanimous vote of council on a program such as this sends a message. Those that vote against it diminish the standing of the position that council would take. 
what's the first question that people ask? Well, what was the vote? And if people are against it, they'll be, they'll be, they'll, that'll give them pause to, get, to understand whether or not it, rather, it, it was important to council or not. They might ask subsequent question, if you're lucky, well, what was the vote count? My hope today is that we, in fact, do have a unanimous decision if we're serious about lobbying to the federal and provincial government uh, on issues of, of housing affordability. You know, it wasn't so long ago that some members of council of a different political party than myself would be voting against very much uh, every component of our housing policy framework, including the RRP, including building of rental housing. And it, it's interesting today that today we're ta talking about the most downtrodden and most needy in our city uh, in the economic scale, but we're talking about the top. And uh, we're getting some support, finally, but we're also getting resistance on that as well, when in fact it's all integrated. My hope is that we set aside politics and in fact move ahead with a program that, based on much research, not just here, from around the world, and much work from staff, that we advance this and get on to the action rather than continuing to have words. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, can we go to the voting queue, please? So uh, we'll vote for the motion. No one's seeking to sever or anything of that sort. We'll just go ahead and vote. So all those in favor of the motion as amended, please show. Okay, and that passes with Councillor Carr in opposition. So thank you very much. We have um, two. Mr. Chair. May I just for a moment, um, I just want to acknowledge the team. I've sat through many, 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 many meetings with them where they've worked on this, and I know you've acknowledged them, but on, on behalf of um, my office, I'd like to thank them. Um, Ms. Dunnett's going on vacation tomorrow, so I, I, this, is a, this is a good goodbye present, but it really thank you to the whole team. You've worked so hard, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I should have done that, too. Okay. Uh, rainwater Management Plan and Green Infrastructure Strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Just couldn't bear to see you go, Mr. Crow. <laughs> okay, we've had the presentation of the questions, so I think we should go straight to speakers. So the first was Lacey Williams, uh, Lost Rivers, Vancouver. And thank you for your patience today. Thank you. Um, I have something to hand out to all of the councillors as well, um, so I can just leave those there and then I'll speak to it um, at the end of the presentation. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everyone <laughs> for their time. Uh, and so my name is Lacey McRae-Williams. I have a Master's of Urban Planning from Ryerson University in Toronto. I'm also doing my Master's of Applied Arts right now at Emily Carr. I founded the Vancouver edition of Lost Rivers Vancouver, which is a community, a water-based community organization that educates on the buried streams in Vancouver. Um, I'm active, active as a key water stakeholder in the Falls Creek Flats planning program. Um, and I was a part of the water stakeholder group for the rainwater management plan. Um, so I'd just like to, can I control, sorry, yeah. The presentation, can I control it? You control it from there. Yeah. Okay, great. From... Okay, great. So, um, I just wanted to um, make reference to um, prioritizing urban water and mature trees um, and make a recommendation for immediate action in relation to the rainwater management plan and green infrastructure strategy. Um, okay. So I would like to encourage the city to connect the urban forestry, urban forest strategy to the rainwater management plan by revising the tree removal permitting process under tree protection bylaw 9958. Um, existing mature trees are invaluable in naturally capturing rain, rainwater where it falls, maintaining soil and slope structure, mitigating the urban heat island effect, achieving biodiversity and sequestering carbon. Um, I just wanted to point to the recommendations from the plan. Um, and think that um, under recommendation C, that um, this could be a um, 
sort of quick target that would help to um, achieve some of the recommendations of the plan. Uh, this is funny. Okay, and then I just wanted to bring your attention to the urban forestry strategy. Um, this is a screen grab from the website, the city's website. Um, so there's a, a goal to plant 150,000 trees by 2020 as a part of the Greenest City Initiative. Um, and I would like to say that that's a great um, goal, but I would also like to point out that a lot of trees, mature trees, have been cut down in the city. Um, here is a uh, article that was written in 2014, um, and it's a quote from the article says, between 1996 and 2013, the number of, I don't know, the number of trees felled annually on private property under permit increased from 470 to 4,935 trees. Um, can we make this full screen again, the presentation? Okay, thank you. Um, and then I just wanted to share um, a very current um, uh, demonstration of clear cut that has happened. Um, there were 59 mature pines and firs clear cut March 15, 2016 along Great Northern Way due to PCI development. This is lot eight um, adjacent Great Northern Way on the north side of the street. Um, here are some photos of the uh, clear cut. So this is adjacent, um, this is the Great Northern Way Trust. It's under the Great Northern Way Trust um, management. Um, <clears throat> and so we, I've been talking um, in consultation a lot with Tim Grant from PCI Development and we had encouraged them to think about the removal of the trees prior to their removal. Um, but he uh, stated that he was able to get, for lot eight, he was able to get a tree remo a removal permit due to um, for development and was able to remove those 59 trees. So I think um, there's a small stand of trees still remaining on lot nine, which is also um, PCI development. And I would just like to encourage um, that by amending the tree protection by law 9958, we can preserve existing mature trees in the city of Vancouver. We are losing too many of these trees to development. And with the drought in Rain City last summer, with record high temperatures in the last few days, and with more severe rainstorms during the winter months, we need to rethink the way we define progress in the city of Vancouver. The 2020 goals for planting new trees is a great target, but we need to be accountable to the existing green infrastructure that provides itself to us without asking anything in return. And then I just want to briefly mention um, the package, the little booklet that I sent around. That was some voices of people who were reflecting on um, on their thoughts of being um, on the clear cut uh, that occurred on Great Northern Way. <clears throat> and these were all just, there were, I mean, there was only 12 voices that came by, but that was just from yesterday when I knew I was gonna be able to speak today. So I wanted to share something with you as a slightly different way of having something to take home and think about this in direct relation to the rainwater um, management plan and green infrastructure strategy. So that's it, thanks. Councillor Reimer, you have questions. Um, I do have questions, and I feel like out of respect for you waiting 12 hours or whatever it is, <laughs> I should ask them. But the challenge I have is that um, a lot of the issues you've raised aren't directly in the report. So maybe what we can do is grab a time when we can connect on the urban forest strategy. Some, we did a fairly massive update to it in 2014 and 15. Okay. And that isn't reflected in some of the numbers. And there's still more, I think, that could be done, but perhaps we could connect on it. Sure. Eric. Yeah, I guess I just, in terms of like moving toward towards sustainability in the city, um, there's clear connections that I think need to be made cross-departmentally or you know, it's like an ecological approach rather than a siloed approach. And that's the reason I thought, finally, after figuring out what to pinpoint, who to speak to, that we, there could be immediate action that takes place because goals for 2020 are one thing, that's great, but cutting down trees for development and then planting saplings that may die due to drought 
is an entire other story. And this is, yeah, it's, a, it's green infrastructure that filters water naturally, captures water on site. So I just wanted to bring that up as something that maybe could be um, like an implementable strategy, immediate strategy um, at, within this plan. So that's why I brought that up. No, I appreciate that. And it is, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to, I'll ask staff and they can illuminate more um, about the changes that have happened since the numbers you've quoted, as well as how um, the urban forest will be integrated into green infrastructure as part of their intention, as part of why they're bringing this program forward is to integrate the two. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I can't ask them while you're at the podium, so it feels okay. awkward. And thank you very much for the book. I really appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry, you've got questions from Councillor Carr. Yes, thanks. Well, first of all, thank you for waiting so long. And, uh, and uh, what a wonderful little booklet. I don't know if that was your idea to yes. put it together, but it, it's, um, it's very impactful. Mm -hmm. um, and my question has to do with the fact that you raised um, amending bylaw 958 um, as a quick action, mm -hmm. uh, you use that term, quick mm -hmm. action, um, that could uh, uh, help protect, obviously, rainwater by, by retaining it. Mm -hmm. um, do you have the specifics? You don't ne necessarily need to give them all tonight, but do you have the specifics about how you think that bylaw should be amended? Um, based on under the tree removal per permit that I was able to receive from the city's website, there's four points that um, trees are able to re be removed. So you can apply for a permit to remove trees if, um, one, um, it's within the building envelope, two, if the uh, trees are deemed unhealthy or diseased, right. three, if, um, if for development or construction, and four, like, oh, if it, if it prevent, provides a serious hazard. Right. So in, ideally, um, to remove um, for construction <laughs> from that, would be great and within the building envelope would be great so that development doesn't just bulldoze trees to plant new street trees that may not may not last so that would okay. be okay that's the kind of i think helpful information to provide an input to our staff as they proceed with detailing this plan out so okay. i really appreciate you coming forward with okay. the idea Thanks. thank you thank you for coming that's all your questions um david grigg you lost sarah primo Another very patient person. And um, like Lacey, I've got a few <laughs> things to distribute to the councillors. Okay. Um, so good evening, um, Chair Meggs and other councillor members. And um, thank you to everybody for your energy all day today. And I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to speak here this evening. Um, my name is Sarah Primo, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the St. George Rainway Project uh, in support of the Rainwater Management Plan and Green Infrastructure Strategy. The St. George Rainway Project is a community-driven uh, green, green infrastructure initiative that seeks to recall a historic stream in Mount Pleasant by capturing and filtering rainwater that falls in the um, surrounding lands. This is both an engineering and a community building initiative. And over the last six years, we've advocated for green infrastructure, painted the much loved street mural, uh, done community design workshops, partnered with Mount Pleasant Elementary School in curriculum development, and much more. The project has also been identified in the city's 2013 Mount Pleasant Public Realm Plan. Um, Part of the inspiration for this project is the recognition that Vancouver used to be home to over 50 salmon bearing streams and to many small creeks that supported a great diversity of species. Almost all of these are now gone. The little creek that we refer to as St. George or Testatlu in the Musqueam language is shown in the red circle. The modern day watershed for St. George is quite small and the natural drainage has now been replaced with a network of below ground sewer pipes. Our vision for the rainway would eventually extend from Robson Park at the south to Great Northern Way Campus in the north. And ultimately, we would love for it to connect to False Creek. It is envisioned to become a biodiversity corridor, an attractive walking and cycling route, a place for community celebrations, and an important learning opportunity for 
the several neighborhood schools. The neighbors and local students have been overwhelmingly supportive of this project and people and students have started asking us why this project isn't happening yet. We know that one of the biggest challenges to implementing a project like this has to do with parking and traffic access because the work is proposed to happen within the street right of way. And we, as this illustration shows, there's a number of different potential configurations of traffic and parking lanes. And we intend to work more closely with the neighbors in the coming months to identify the needs block by block. Another challenge is the misperception that we want to dig up the entire street and get rid of all the infrastructure. But in fact, uh, the rainway would be designed to capture and filter most of the rainfall events. But during large storms, the rain would still go into the existing underground storm sewer pipe. There's a number of excellent examples of projects that we can draw on for inspiration and ideas, including our very own Creekway Park near New Brighton. And there are many excellent examples in Portland. The city of Zurich is also an excellent precedent to look to. Uh, in Zurich, they had um, most of the system is actually still combined sewers. And instead of separating their combined sewers, they chose to recreate 18 kilometers of urban streams with the intent of creating urban biodiversity corridors and making the city more attractive and livable. So we think that there's great potential for Vancouver to follow Zurich's example. Simply separating combined sewers does not solve our water quality problems as it causes untreated stormwater to go straight into the ocean, um, which is illustrated on the left in this slide. Um, we believe that green infrastructure, um, as this strategy speaks to, has the potential to filter um, the runoff from um, existing separated systems. In addition, in parts of the city that still have combined sewers, we think that green infrastructure has the great capacity to either delay or avoid the need to separate sewers by preventing the large volumes of water that go into the combined sewer system and cause those combined sewer overflow events. Green stormwater infrastructure can also play an important role in restoring and supporting urban biodiversity. Overlaying the map of existing biodiversity hotspots with a map of our lost creeks helps us to imagine how recreating these corridors could help reconnect our existing biodiversity areas. And we think that connecting, uh, we think that constructed waterways such as the St. George Rainway offer a new model for how the city can restore the health of our terrestrial and aquatic habitat while enhancing greenways and making the city more livable. In closing, we would like to respectfully request that Council consider prioritizing the St. George Rainway, or a part of it, as a priority project under the Rainway Management Plan, and we would be happy to discuss ways of achieving this in partnership with the City. Thank you. Thank you. Well timed. Um, I have a question, which is uh, over the uh, number of times that Council has seen the uh, the plans for Great Northern Way, there's been a discussion of water features each time. Have you realized any changes in the plans? I haven't seen them, but uh, I wonder if, if there's any acknowledgement yet by uh, Emily Carr and its developers that something could be done in that regard. Um, we have been in um, regular contact with um, PCI uh, developers um, and their consultants on how to create uh, what's being called St. George Plaza. Um, and we appreciate the efforts that they're making to try to make rainwater visible. We still do have questions about the functionality um, of those features and whether they would be sized enough to, um, to make a difference. I think the target right now is just for them to be better than the pre-development, which is not really, um, there's, that's a pretty low bar um, to meet. So um, we appreciate their efforts and, and we obviously always you know, would like them to go further with it, but they are trying, I think. Councillor Carr, do you have a question? I do. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you for your patience and uh, and the work you do in the community. Um, I did receive your not only the report tonight that you've given, but um, your correspondence. And uh, so um, and you directed, I think, all of us to our, your website, which is really great. My question is around um, the uh, whether or not you as a group have 
um, developed a plan that is sequential to implement that the grand vision is is beautiful um, so how but how do you plan to get there are there sort of pilots that are priorities that could work that are scalable that can you know start in steps yes thanks we do have uh, ideas for what priority projects could happen based on um, our understanding of the corridor and where the, there's the greatest amount of support and enthusiasm for the project and where the greatest opportunities are. And we do see it as being something that could be implemented incrementally. There's a conceptual plan for the alignment of the rainway that has been developed um, at a, in conjunction with city staff um, in 2012. Um, but we would like to have some um, indication from the city that there's support for the project um, in order for us to proceed with developing more detailed designs. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you have, but you have been in touch with, I mean, I, I know that because Mr. Crow um, yesterday actually indicated that there are conversations that are happening. Is that, that's the case? Um, that's right. We have been in touch with um, Mr. Crow and other members of um, engineering to talk about um, potential pilot projects right. along the way. Good. Good to hear. Thank you. Mr. Deal. Yes, thanks very much. And I appreciate you doing this. I'm a huge fan of the Lost Streams projects. As someone among many of us in this room who care a lot about fish and things fishy. Um, I just wanted to, this is a statement, not a question. I'm totally breaking the rules, but it's late. Um, I, I uh, sit on the public, uh, as a liaison to the public art committee and uh, PCI did present their preliminary design for public art on the site just last week. And, uh, and they certainly are incorporating water and referring to the stream. So I think your questions around scale and, and functionality are good ones that I'll make sure at that table. Sorry, I broke the rules. Is that okay with you? That's my question. Would that be okay? You could have, you could have made those remarks during debate. Uh, Councillor Reimer. I can't bring myself to break the rules, so I just have questions for staff. My bad. No? Are we on to staff questions or no? Uh, are, yeah, if, that's, if there's no further questions for you, thanks for coming. I wasn't sure what Councillor Reimer wanted. Uh, do we need another round of questions? You got some questions? I had two, yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Crow? You have questions. Are you kidding? Um, this is Mr. Crow's last chance to speak to council. We've kept him here for a lot of hours. So yes, I have questions. Um, a couple, in fact. Um, first one refers to the St. George Rainway. You've worked, as noted, with them for, I mean, they've been working on this for a number of years. You've worked with them for some years. They are referenced as one of the potential quick starts. So can you explain how they would become a definite quick start? Uh, yes, and just out of fairness, other staff have done most of the work with the St. George Rainway Group, including some in our sewers and drainage design branch and planning, and many departments have engaged on it, um, and they're a wonderfully active community group. But um, uh, So we already have committed, actually, um, just recently to the uh, community group that we um, have delayed some planned regular paving work that would have occurred uh, probably this year so that we can embark on a more thorough design process and go through those various options um, with them and the broader community of the neighborhood to uh, land on a um, consensus of the appropriate concept. Uh, so that's the first and most uh, well, sort of, that's the most critical next step is to move it from a vision of a very keen group um, who have been working hard at it for years to a um, project that has the broad support. And that will be through our transportation and drainage and et cetera staff to fully engage with them and go through that uh, design process. And the intention is to embark upon that later this year. Okay. And the my expectation would be that that would lead to a um, a more, uh, what should I say, a closer to final design that would generate cost estimates and we'd enter into uh, the plans of how to fund the project. Um, the project is not currently funded um, and that would be one of the hurdles is, is it something that could somehow be done during this capital plan or would it be in the next capital plan? Uh, but the first thing to do is to really nail down the scope and cost and see what the options are. 
So as you, if council were to pass the recommendations today, the next step is implementation planning, which would include um, this kind of costing and it would come back to council and we could enable it at that stage. Yes, I mean, the, as we uh, tried to show during the presentation, the, the planning exercise doesn't stop the project work that's intended during that period. And we've already committed to embarking on that project planning exercise for the St. George Rainway um, this year. So okay. this, uh, this doesn't delay it. It actually kind of accelerates the imperative for it because it gives that extra push of new council policy rather than it just being a staff and community-led initiative. Okay. No, that's very helpful. Um, and then on the, the questions around the urban forest strategy, um, I rainwater and uh, stormwater management were kind of the impetus for this, but that um, from the presentation yesterday, we saw that the, the goal is now to wrap in the urban forest strategy into a broader green infrastructure group. Uh, yes, in fact, the urban forest is referenced in the technical report. Uh, there's the note that the uh, tree canopy is an extremely valuable rainwater management asset. Um, and even the winter canopy, which is, you know, a substantial portion is deciduous, still uh, intercepts, depending on the neighborhood, uh, a, a mature tree canopy in an urban environment can intercept, seven, I think the number is 17 to 25 percent of the average annual rainfall. So it's an extremely valuable component of mm -hmm. rainwater management. And of course, it also transpires that, oops, sorry, back into the environment, um, which is another goal. We want to absorb it into the soil or get it back into the natural uh, rain cycle, um, water cycle. So th there's the recognition in the report that the urban forest is a, uh, one of the key tools and uh, that planning the utilization of the toolkit needs to be coordinated with the urban forest strategy. Um, so the it's, it's just a concept at this point, but that's part of the work program. So in December 2015, we passed six priority actions related to development trees on private land and specifically around development permitting. There was two large pieces of research that we asked staff to go away and do and bring back this year. So that will likely then now come back with the green infrastructure strategy. Um, I'm sorry, I know this is not, not your area of that. expertise. I'm sorry, it's not my area of expertise, but definitely whenever a report comes back on either topic, they'll need to be the interconnection between the strategies because they're closely linked. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jang. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Crow or Brian. I just wanted to say that I'm so glad you left Easy Park to come back and do this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Good question, Councillor Carr. <laughs> I'm uh, yes, I'm glad I did too. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. A little more liberal in our process, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I just want to say I love the maps. Um, no, my, um, and thank you for staying and, and for really for your service. It's, uh, it's wonderful. I do have some questions that I didn't get to ask yesterday because I ran out of time. So if you don't mind, I would like to ask those. Um, first of all, uh, I'm interested in, um, uh, the, it was noted in this, in this report around how much of the, um, uh, the land surface is our, our streets. Mm -hmm. and lanes and um are we going to be requiring i know that residents can get together and and do a petition to have a lane paved are we going to be requiring from now on or maybe we already do uh require that now um, those lanes are permeable surface not impermeable um, at the moment we don't require that they be permeable but we also discourage pavement in lanes mm. quite generally now um, and um, we don't see it adding a lot of value. Um, and so there are far fewer local petitions for lane paving mm -hmm. now. Um, it's not happening very frequently. Yeah. And we have experimented with some new lane designs like the country lane design, yes. which is much more progressive and it actually is nicer looking too, yeah. frankly, um, which provides just two running strips mm -hmm. for the wheel paths, and then um, a green landscape of the rest of the lane. 
and, uh, on a, and the expectation is that kind of design will be more common. And if we do pave anything, I think we'll be looking at permeable pavements. Right. But, um, <clears throat> to be determined. It's good. To, it's good to hear, and it's good to get that message out there to the public. I've also heard a number of people from the public mention that they they'd like to see more greening of their lanes in general, um, not just in terms of in, like permeable surfaces, but also like trees and. Right. Of like course, the challenge is you still have to fit the service vehicles down the lanes, and, things, <laughs> right. and they're a pretty tight space. But there are ways to improve them. Uh, in environmental and social ways, like the uh, country lane style. Right. Um, the other thing is that, that um, I wanted to ask about is uh, whether you've looked at some of the other cities that are, that are doing some leadership on this. And I'm aware that in Portland, for example, um, the, um, uh, when bicycle routes are chosen, and they do that in consultation with n the neighborhoods, that the neighborhoods are given the chance to put forward green infrastructure along the bicycle routes. So many of the routes in um, Portland, for example, the committee will ask for the community will ask for swales um, or you know bulges that are that are infiltration uh, bulges. And so whether or not we are we would consider that because I think that's a great idea. Uh, and certainly, and, and I think some of the precedents for the green infrastructure we already have are around the, the green ways mm -hmm. and the bicycle routes, you know, such as Ontario Street and the 37th Avenue Greenway, et cetera. And those are very much community-driven projects when they're designed. There's a lot of engagement and we're, uh, it, it's actually very easy to sell to people that we should incorporate green infrastructure because they see the so many... Um, so many benefits of it, so uh, it will be more and more frequent in those projects. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Reimer. Are there others on the queue with questions, or are you waiting to the... Okay, so... Uh, there was a thing that said give floor to selected user, but that has... Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. So, Councillor Carr's questions. Um, in my neighborhood, uh, some of those um, corner bulges that were rain catchments, uh, rainwater catchments, were put in a couple of years ago, and they were I think some of the earlier ones. And um, and there were a lot of comments around the neighborhood about how they weren't being maintained, or you know, there was just sort of some random long grasses growing in them. And and uh, and I knew what they were, but. Uh, well, we don't want to have sign clutter. I wonder if there's any way that, uh, until they become commonplace and the default that everyone expects, if there's any way of marking them or, or if we plant things in them, because these are just sort of, they're, just, they're, they're, they're running wild, which is fine, and it's perfect, actually, but, uh, but people don't understand why they're there. Um, there certainly is the potential to do that, and thank you for the suggestion. I mean, if we look at the uh, Green Streets program and the the, the, the gardens that weren't yeah. specifically designed to be rain gardens, but they still have some benefit. You know, we've we've designed very modest size signage so it doesn't okay. interfere with the natural yeah. style of it. Um, and I would think we could start incorporating something like that into the rain gardens as well. Right. Um, and of course, a, a significant part of this program is public outreach, so we need to develop those kind of tools. Right. Even stamped into the, if it's new pavement, right next to it, into the curb. Mm -hmm. Something yes, like that. And we used to stamp the dates in sidewalks. We could have other symbols. We've had fish exactly. on catch basins. There's, there's ideas like that that Rain drops or something. we could be doing. Yes. And thank you for being here late and for all of your work for the city. My pleasure. Thank you. Mr. Reimer. Um, it is a great pleasure to move the recommendations in the report A through E. Um, there is some really incredible symmetry about being here with uh, Mr. Crow and with the folks from the St. George Rainway project that back in 2009 when we first uh, brought forward the Greenest City, um, the St. George folks, Rita and others came and they wanted, they wanted this and they wanted that and they wanted other things. and. You know the the greenest city opens up all these possibilities, and and I I um, I this is the challenge of human communication. I remember what I thought you said, um, Mr. Crow. I don't know if it is in fact what you said, but what I heard was um, that's impossible. Like those things cannot happen. Um, and to see over the course of time that um, to see how engineers just really embrace these concepts around green infrastructure and how we can. 
make all of this possible these sort of because it's not just about aspirations for a greener city it's about places you know you look at these pictures um, that you showed in the presentation yesterday it's about places where children can play and and sort of experience a world that um you know in many cities in the world that just doesn't exist anymore um, i don't want to start naming names of cities but i think we've all traveled to cities where you sort of think wow it's architecturally amazing but where are where's the wild places so um, to know that not only can we have wild places, but that they actually are positive um, green, positive economic, positive social contributors to a city um, is pretty exciting stuff. But I think as both of the speakers said, we have a, still quite a long way to go on some of these big chunks. So this is, um, this is the next big step that we can take. It feels like a very odd way to Thank you for this work by keeping you here until 8.15 at night. So um, I'm glad I, I took the time yesterday to say it, but I'll say it again. Um, and I am extraordinarily proud of the work that you've done through the course of your career, but this really is, um, it is a huge achievement. And I, I don't think it can be understated. So thank you and your team for that. It, it's definitely the team. So uh, I will pass that on and we, you're welcome on their behalf. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, so let's uh, I think the motion was already moved. Was that? Oh, Councillor Lou, you're back. Okay. I thought, I thought it was on. I wasn't on the screen. You, you disappeared for a while. Oh, I was just going to take a, a minute to uh, thank the team, but more importantly to thank Brian for your years of services. As uh, you know, you, many reports to Council, uh, many related reports like this. I remember reports, whether it be Still Creek or uh, issues related to the Olympic Village and the sanctuary at Hastings Park, trying to not, not pump water into there. And, and you know, it's all, all part of this equation here. And you've been working at, uh, at this for some time and many of those various components and many others that I just can't come to mind for me right now. But thank you for your service uh, for the city. I wanted to say it publicly and I know we're gonna have a party for you at some point in time. <clears throat> where we'll, there'll be some some drainage of some other type, <laughs> but but we look forward to that. But thank you uh, publicly for uh, for all your years of service. You're veering out of order there, Councillor. Um, Let's okay. talk about beer. <laughs> Let's go to a voting queue. I believe it was moved by Councillor Reimer at some point. Okay, and it passed unanimously. Thanks very much, everybody, and to you and your team. Okay, so uh, last item, grant request for a tour of Women's Resource Society. Um, does anyone require a presentation on this? Moved. Who moved it? Oh, there's a speaker, sorry, Ms. Hawson, yeah, of course. Okay, so uh, first our speakers, Jean Swanson. Okay, hi everybody, I'm Jean Swanson and I'm speaking on behalf of the Carnegie Action Project and I would like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish people and thank them for allowing us to be here. Um, CAP supports the grant to, to Ateria to run the Patrick Anthony for a year. We hope you can extend it past a year and to other hotels and maybe bump up the subsidies so they have the means to run a better place. Um, I. We thought it would be good for me to come here today to make sure that you know about the hotel situation in the downtown east side. It's not just the quality in folks that need a place to live. As we've said before, at CAP, we're afraid that homelessness is gonna really go up in the near future because there's no welfare rate buildings are being built, virtually none, because welfare is so low and because the SRO rents are rising so fast. So a few weeks ago, we released our annual hotel report, which is just being distributed now. 
and we found that the average lowest rents in privately owned and run hotels is $517 a month, leaving people on welfare a mere $93 for everything except rent. And we also discovered this new trend to push rents up beyond 500 and 600 to eight or nine or a thousand dollars a month. This is for SROs with a bathroom down the hall. We actually found an ad on Craigslist for the Golden Crown for a SRO at 1,500 a month. Um, since our report has come come out, we've also discovered that the landlord at the Metropole is offering low-income tenants a thousand dollars to move out, and that the Lotus. We've heard that low-income people are being offered 2500 to move out. So when you're on a disability, it's hard to resist this kind of money. It might be the only time in your life when you'll be able to have it. So some people are taking it, even though there's virtually no place for them to go. Since the report has come out, we've also discovered this list of hotels that are for sale, and that's been handed out to you too. It's on the front and the back. So. And hold, well, if you look at some of the ads for these hotels, the Harbor Rooms, the Shamrock, the Centennial, et cetera, you find that the, the ads have say things like ever increasing rents and they advertise the gentrifying nature of the area. And um, so we're afraid that these current rents, which are in the $500 range, are going to be going up more to the $900 range when when the places get sold, which means that there is no way people on welfare, disability, or a senior's pension can afford to live there. Yesterday, I was door knocking at the triple six, at triple six Alexander, and I talked to the resident manager there, who's lived there for 17 years, and she just got an eviction notice. The place has just been sold, so everyone there is vulnerable too. Um, so we're basically hoping that all levels of government, you included, will buy or lease some more hotels, at least until more social housing that homeless people and SRO residents can afford is built. Uh, you've, uh, you've not only got the quality in people to house, but all the folks who could be perched, pushed out of these ne newly purchased hotels. Actually, one of those is vacant, so it's an opportunity. So we agree with the points in Wendy Peterson's letter, most importantly, and it would be great if someone would make a motion to this effect, to create a strategy to secure more privately owned SROs like the Patrick Anthony. Um, if you don't do this, we're going to have a lot more homelessness, and the downtown east side will look kind of like the cover of our report, which is our fear. We've asked the NDP to advocate for this. We're hoping for a meeting soon with the province. We've asked the federal minister to come for a tour. So we're not putting all of our pressure on the city, but the city could take, take the lead. Um, you're paying less than $100 per person per room per month to subsidize a Patrick Anthony, way less than it would cost to run a shelter or pay police or health costs of a homeless person. So we urge you to look at the San Francisco examples that Wendy provided, their master lease and small sites acquisition programs and their code enforcement programs. We think those could help a lot if they could be implemented here in Vancouver. So none of this means that we love SROs, we don't, but there's hardly any welfare rate social housing in sight and we need action now to keep people off the street and out of shelters. Thank you, Councillor Louis has a question for you. I don't. Thank you. Oh, okay, Councillor Carr. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fonson, so much for um uh for so waiting uh so long and um and also just for all this work and uh and, and CCAPS. Um thank you for presenting us with that that hotel report. Um your request, um, as you know it well, first of all, this is a grant, so it's not we can't insert um, something uh, like you just requested, which arises out of Ms. Peterson's letter. Um, but as you know, um, I had put a motion forward earlier to council um, a number of months back, which is resulting in, uh, it will result in a report back on actions, including um, acquiring uh, uh, 500 rooms. So uh, when we, I mean, I think that 
Ms. Bond is here. Um, she's hearing your statement again of how important it is to to acquire um, those rooms and um, and and the desperateness um, given, especially the increasing uh, rent costs. Yeah, I hung around for all these hours to try and inject an element of urgency into it. Yes. Well, you have, you have. I mean, those statements you've just made and the and the details. I mean, they're shocking, um, really, in terms of you know people being offered money to to move out we know that that's happening but i mean you're, you've you've summarized it so i thank you for that uh councillor louis did you have questions or uh no i was just prepared to move the recommendation okay it's been moved sort of debate if not let's move to the vote Those in favor of the grant, please show. Requires eight votes. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. So the standing committee portion of this meeting is now complete and we'll convene a regular council. Mr. Okay. Acting Mayor. We will now reconvene regular council to deal with the recommendations and actions to today's standing committee on city finances and services meeting. Madam Clerk, could we have the roll call, please? Council Louie in the chair. Mayor Robertson, absent. Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Deal. Here. Councillor Jang. Councillor Reimer. Councillor Meggs. Here. Councillor Ball, uh, leave of absence. Councillor Carr. Councillor Affleck. Councillor DiGenova. You have okay. quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We need a motion to adopt the Standing Committee's recommendations by Councillor Deal, seconded by Councillor Jang. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. We need a motion to adjourn. Moved by <laughs> Councillor Reimer, second by Councillor Deal. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, we're adjourned. Thank you.